Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Megan Olson with the Investment Advisor Association, and I welcome you to our webinar, Uncharted Waters, Navigating Advisory Office Reentry. This webinar, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. You may submit questions to the speakers at any time during the webinar by typing them through the chat feature. Only the speakers will see your questions. Questions will be addressed as time allows. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded July 9th, 2020. I would now like to turn the presentation over to our moderator, Maura Karatz, Partner and Director of Human Resources and Administration at Harding Lovner. Maura. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate the opportunity to connect with the IAA, the panelists and the participants on the call today to discuss a topic that has occupied our minds since likely earlier this year, at a minimum. With restrictions beginning to ease for the vast majority of us in the industry who have been working from home, we'll be talking today about what advisory firms should be thinking about as they consider having their employees return to their offices. I'm pleased to be joined by Matthew Kaiser, a partner in Kirkland and Ellis' labor and employment practice in Washington, DC. Dennis Williams, a partner in Kirkland's healthcare practice in New York City, and Patricia Williams, a partner in the Managed Human Resources Services Department of the consulting firm Markham, also in DC. We have a lot to discuss today, so let's begin. Dennis, we'll begin with you. The first question many of us have debated is when. When should employees return to the office and what factors must employers consider and act on before employees return? How are you helping your clients to think about office reopening issues and when to reopen? Sure, Th thanks so much. And really a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, with the IA members uh, and everybody. Um, in terms of you know, when, it, it certainly has been an evolving um, item for those in, in your line of the business. And you know, it's very different than other types of businesses like you know, essential businesses that have otherwise been open maybe the entire time. You know, so what we've really been seeing is kind of waves depending on the parts of the country uh, on where uh, incidents are and, you know, following with regards to the various phases. I mean, we looked at this a, a month ago, even up in New York, you know, where we were on phase one, two, and three, you know, it really was dependent. I think what we've really started to see is a move towards, you know, a number of these businesses to the extent that they can efficiently and effectively get back. Folks definitely are, are looking to do that and feel that they, you know, need to get folks back in the office. At the same point, many at this point have, if they have not already gone back, are looking at it more of, hmm, if we haven't gone back yet, should we wait for the rest of the summer and kind of let things play out and go for, you know, the after Labor Day? I would say for any business that is yet not back in the office, almost nearly all are looking at either September or a later date thereafter if they haven't. Most are not looking to start something in the middle of the summer um, just because of logistically they think that that is just going to allow more time for us to learn more information, hopefully people get more settled. And for many, many of these businesses, uh, like yourselves, have been doing okay doing it remotely. And so we don't want to interrupt that, you know, aspect of it. And people have been adjusting particularly well with, you know, families, and, you know, with children and the like are out of school and managing that. Um, it would be a bigger challenge right now, particularly where camps and other things are not available uh, for children. Um, so those are a couple of things I think other other than that the other sides of it has really been where there is an incident and whether or not you know how can people get to the office if you're you know in a city situation like Manhattan it's a real challenge you know how to navigate that um, you know public transportation um, is a challenge I'd say most other situations outside of a handful of major uh, metropolitan cities there are alternatives to transportation and folks can consider you know driving or if you're outside of a city and in, in suburbia you like myself you know, getting around is absolutely fine. There's plenty of parking. You're, you're able to go in and out as you can. And folks have actually really pushed towards doing it. It's been interesting that many people have looked actually that some of the younger um, uh, employees really want to be back in the office because maybe they're in an apartment or they're in a smaller environment. And so the idea of what's been going on for months is actually taking a toll on them where they really want to. And so we have seen some employers where maybe the office itself isn't going to be opening and some senior folks may not be coming in, but some others uh, and some junior people really want to come in and that it's really overall um, good for them. And so it is a balancing between a uh, number of factors based on your particular business and the, and the employees that have working for you and where you're located. Um, so Thanks, sure, uh, if other questions there. 
Very good, thank you. Patricia, you nodded your head there. I'm curious to know as you work with your clients, are you finding that offices are open on, opening on a voluntary basis through the summer, say, and then later uh, a date whereby more people would return to the office? Well, for, um, for Markham's offices, there's a wide variety of office opening dates and, and it is based, as Dennis said, um, largely on access to public transportation. So our DC office is, is open sort of unofficially as of this past Monday, um, but not officially at least as of now until after Labor Day. Um, and we're finding a lot of our client organizations are having the same kind of dates. They're very fluid, they're very flexible. Mm -hmm. In time, we've already had client organizations that have already made the decision either not to come back until after Labor Day, and several clients have said, not this calendar year. Understood. It seems a common theme in that regard. Mm -hmm. So as we prepare the offices, whether it be for voluntary access or a more official date later in the year, I know for us and, and others we've spoken to, there's been a lot of thinking around infection control and sanitation in the building. Matt, how are you advising your clients with respect to best practices? especially considering the growing concern about airborne transmission of the virus. Yeah, well, thank you all very much for this opportunity to speak with everyone. Um, I, I think that uh, employers can look at several uh, places to figure out the best protocols for a safe uh, work environment. Uh, there's, there's OSHA guidance, there's CDC guidance, uh, then there's state and local guidance as well. Uh, and so, uh, and, and there's also uh, working with your landlord. So to the extent that you are in an office building that's shared with many other clients, your landlord presumably is also going to be working and trying to figure out what they're going to be doing about sanitizing um, common areas, elevators, or they're going to be limits on how many people are in elevators. Are there gonna be signs up that say you need a social distance here? Uh, are there gonna be face coverings uh, you know, required or provided when you come into those common spaces? Uh, one of the other things that you mentioned was uh, you know, HVAC systems. Uh, as, as more is developing about the potential airborne uh, transmission of COVID, I mean, that's a very hot topic and a lot of uh, buildings now are bringing in HVAC experts and trying to figure out, do we need new filtration uh, systems? Do we need different ways that our, our um, airflow is going to uh, happen? Um, and then there are some uh, OSHA guidance already, which seem uh, kind of obvious, but you know, trying to look at your work site and see are there ways to do flexible uh, or staggered shifts so not as many people are there? Discouraging workers from obviously sharing tools, desks, office spaces, uh, et cetera, uh, making sure that there's you know, an enhanced uh, deep cleaning and more frequent cleaning of all the common spaces uh, and the bathrooms uh, and the like. And so those are some of the, the you know, ways that that folks are thinking about uh, sanitizing and making their uh, workplace safer. And it's my understanding, and perhaps um, Dennis, your experience may be a bit different, Patricia as well, but when you think about multi-tenant buildings, and Matt just touched on the idea of in a, a relationship with your property manager or your landlord, um, there's only so much screening be, being done at the common area level. So let's say entry to the building versus entry to a tenant space. So what are the protocols for employers um, to consider with employees before and as they enter or exit your office space? Um, health attestations, are they the norm? Are you advising clients to use apps to track information? And I think Matt just touched on PPE to some degree required encouraged? Is training provided? How are we thinking about that? Um, and what advice are you providing clients? Sure. Um, sure maybe I'll, I'll start and if that works. Um, so I, I think on, on that one, um, as Matt indicated, with regards to the landlord side of the house, you know, in, mo in some of the larger, you know, multi-tenant buildings and, you know, cities, 
we really have seen them come out with pretty fulsome policies, uh, and including uh, many of them have come out with some form of thermal screening that they're doing themselves and um, before anybody's allowed, you know, card access. For other buildings, you know, where it's a, you know, in two-story, three-story building and people are going in and out of the office, that's just not a practical situation. It's just not what's going to be put in place. Uh, and there might be multiple entry points. Uh, what we have seen is uh, limit the number of entry points to buildings um, so that folks are coming in and out um, of one or two at max so we don't have it in multiple locations. Uh, and then overall, um, I would say a lot of businesses really have gone uh, and frankly, some cities and states have made requirements with regards to health access stations. Um, you know, we've been through this. We had, you know, seen this as something that was coming down the pike. I think as uh, some states in the South had opened up, they were not requiring them. They were not requiring masks or any of those things. But as some of the states uh, more north, you know, whether it be in Chicago, New York, California, um, Boston, et cetera, you know, you've really seen the regulatory side of it move move up and. Um, you know, for New York, for example, there's a requirement that every day that somebody does complete a daily health attestation prior to coming into the office. They don't need to, you know, check the box on every single thing, but they need to read it, confirm they, that they've taken their temperature and that they, you know, don't have a temperature, uh, depending on where you are, at least 100.4, or in some situations in New York, it's 100. Um, and then, you know, the same in other parts of the country. The lowest threshold, by the way, is 100. Um, it was really, Texas was the first one to do that. But then it is the other items, and it is updated for CDC guidance uh, on what the current signs and symptoms of COVID-19 are. Um, you know, GI issues was something that uh, was only added about a month or so ago, and is actually one of the more common uh, situations that seems to be one of the ways it first presents. Um, so we definitely have seen this evolution towards the daily attestations. I would say um, not nearly all companies are doing after, you know daily. Some have definitely done a you know, a weekly, some have done, you know, a one-time attestation that everybody's confirming that prior to coming in they are, uh, but it's very much specific to the location um, as well as the nature of the service line that they're in. Um, and then it's how you manage that because the, that information you want to ensure is uh, protected information, particularly if somebody is confirming that they have some sign or symptom um, and that you're not disclosing it that way. And HR, this has been a huge undertaking, um, really, um, a ton of work with regards to HR overall on this entire process um, and handling of COVID uh, in general. Um, so th those are a couple of things I would say. Uh, you mentioned PPE. I, I just want to touch on that. I think what we really see is the use of PPE is, is you know, become this uh, word in our vernacular now, but there's two curtains really. There's facial coverings and then there's PPE. And I would say majority of situations where anybody's being required to wear something, uh, you know, by order or, you know, or guidance, uh, and the business is really pushing for it, or it's required, it is a facial covering. It's not a formal PPE necessarily. A certain lines of business, I'd say most of the IAM members, you're not going to be required um, to, you know, have your employees wearing some form of PPE. But more likely, if you're going to do it, it's going to be a facial covering. It could be a scarf. It could be a surgical mask. It can be lots of variations. And what we're really seeing from the studies that are coming out is that is really helpful to prevent the transmission. And I think we might talk a little later about things on contact tracing and, you know, handling of positives and the like, but the use of a facial covering when people are going in common spaces within the office, we've really seen that to be a, a um, successful mitigating factor for the passing of uh, COVID between different employees. Thank you, Dennis. Patricia, would you say that what you're hearing and what you're advising your clients is in line with what Dennis has mentioned? Yes, very, very similar types of strategies and our clients are, you know, as you might imagine, they're grappling with all different kinds of, of strategies for how people return to work, how they move through the building. Um, most of our client organizations are requiring that employees wear a uh, cloth face mask, preparing for return to work by purchasing masks for all employees. Employees are certainly welcome to bring their own, but just being prepared with that. Um, having someone, whether it's uh, an employee of the client organization or someone with building management stationed, you know, if there's mm -hmm. no access to make sure no more than either one or two people get on the elevator at the same time, hand sanitizer stations, um, and then things like um, closing down the common areas within the office, mm -hmm. your, your kitchens, cafeterias, coffee stations, even conference rooms. Um, where people can congregate, just closing those off as much as possible. Um, and we are seeing some clients grappling with decisions about taking temperatures upon arrival in the office and mm -hmm. 
there is one client that I work with that um, serves children and families um, that is wrestling with the idea of um, testing employees prior to entry. So, and we've gone back and forth about how testing is only a moment in time and, and all of that kind of thing. But, you know, these are, these are issues that are, there's no easy answers. Um, there's some common threads that we see here and there, but um, it's, a, it's tough to work through these issues and do everything possible to make sure that employees are safe. And more before we go on, I think one thing that you had asked about was about apps, and I don't think I touched on that. So apps are definitely out there. I'm sure many of you have seen the apps. Some of you may have, you know, started trying them out or looked at them. Um, I would say some are definitely going towards the apps. Many of them are not fully functional yet. Um, they will be, I think, later this summer. Um, but there are a handful of them out there, um, and some have, you know, lots of variations that, that can be tailored. Where, for example, the app might, until somebody gets a clear, they can't. They're not going to get a barcode to get them into the office, for example. There's a couple like that. Uh, there are other ones that just send you a message. You never find out what the issue that the person is confirming is, but instead you just get, you know, they're either a green or a red, you know, and that way you know if they're coming in or not. Um, but there's lots of variations. I would still say a majority of businesses have not gone down that road. And if they are doing attestations, most are going with, um, you know, an email type situation or, you know, something else that they already have, um, you know, in the system there. And on, on testing, you know, we'll talk about maybe we'll table that one for a moment, but on actually doing temperature screening, I wanted to just give, you know, kind of the variations here that we see. We certainly, you know, thermal scanning could be done. I think most IA members, that, that's just not going to be what, you know, is practical uh, and what, what would even, you know, for the number of employees, it's, it's just not cost effective um, or, or needed. And, you know, I think what you do see is that um, many may have a, you know, a handheld thermometer or you know one that's on a station that people can walk up to and get it but still a majority of businesses where they are requiring or you know people that do temperature screening it's being done by folks at home and you're relying on individuals to you know frankly be adults in a form and you know confirm that they actually took their temperature and that they don't have a temperature prior to coming in um, so I just wanted to mention th those pieces I appreciate that Dennis definitely I think it was testing some of the um, questions come about because of frequency as well. So what is the right frequency to have people tested? Um, and again, going to the idea of possibly voluntary entry versus required, you, it makes you think about these things twice over. Um, Patricia, you started to lead into something that I thought may get to social distancing within the office space. So there are a number of firms who have open floor plans, challenged a little bit differently than those who have cubicle arrangements. Mm -hmm. How have your clients been tackling this particular issue? Um, again, a lot of really creative strategies we've been hearing about and just sort of mulling over different types of things, but especially in offices where there is an open environment, um, there have been some strategies like um, staggering schedules, one of those things that was, was mentioned earlier, so that you have employees who either are, a, you know, a week one or a week two group and they alternate back and forth. Um, and things like, um, again, since the conference spaces are not being utilized for meetings, mm -hmm. having some employees utilize some of the, the conference spaces as opposed to being up, you know, very close to another coworker in an open space. Um, and then simple things like requiring employees to wear a mask as they move through the office. But if they aren't close to someone in their workspace or they have an actual office, perhaps not requiring it while you're sitting at your desk or unless you're working with someone else. And this is another um, strategy that we've seen is that um, uh, client organizations are implementing a, uh, a no drop-in policy. Whereas you and I are probably used to just popping into a colleague's office for a quick chat, you know, maybe knocking on the door jam and saying, hey, do you have a minute? And so, trying to break those habits and communicating up front that that's, you know, has to be curtailed and you have to reach out to an employee if you want to have a conversation, either get on the phone or say, is it okay if I come by and then distancing while you're having that conversation. So that's going to take a little bit of um, breaking old habits, but I think those are new good habits to promote. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Before we go on to our next topic, I just want to take one of the questions from the chat. And Matt, if you wouldn't mind commenting on this, it's a question that uh, pertains to liability. Tenant, 
versus property manager or landlord in a multi-tenant building. Have you had experience with your clients in this regard? Yeah, I mean, I think that for the uh, public spaces that are controlled by the landlord, uh, then the landlord and the employer would probably be jointly and, and severally liable. I mean, they both have uh, been a duty to, to have a, a safe uh, workspace. Uh, but then I think once you're in your own uh, office space, that primary liability will go uh, to the employer. But I think that's why it's really crucial to have a say uh, as to what the building uh, property management is doing because you could have the, all the social distancing and all the, the safety protocols meeting all the required standards in your own actual space. But if the common areas and the entrances and everything are free for all, then that's gonna kind of defeat the whole purpose of, of following best practices in your own office space. Thank you, Matt. So if we can, we'll turn to the inevitable, which is sooner or later, we will collectively have uh, employees come down with the virus. So what then? Dennis, what would you consider best practice in this regard? Sure. Uh, and again, I tell you what, what we did back in March was very different what, you know, for those of you that are looking to open your businesses and haven't yet had, um, you know, a positive, um, and hopefully we never do, but I think most businesses in reality, if they're open, they probably have or are going to very soon, unfortunately, or, or will in the future. So I think the first thing is really understanding um, that um, what you need to do. First, if an employee is coming in and they are symptomatic, we need to make sure they get out of the office as quickly as possible in, in a proper manner um, and make sure that they are getting a facial covering back. You know, they don't, if you're not requiring masks, that's, that's a mask on them and gets the next, you know, they get out of the building. If they need to get to a hospital or healthcare setting immediately, you know, based on their symptoms, then, you know, we should be trying to do that and help them get there. Otherwise we should be getting them, you know, to get home and drive home as quickly as possible. Um, and then dealing with the situation. I would tell you what, what we're seeing really is people might be showing a symptom. They don't come to work. We find out a couple of days later that they got tested and they tested positive. Now, what do we do? And, you know, we can talk about contract tracing and the like and maybe later, but one of the things I'd say is, you know, you as an employer have the right to require anybody to get tested and Matt can talk more about the, the issues there. Um, but the other side of that is, you know, your time to notify people is really a look back period. And so we've seen a lot on the look back right now it is, you know, you're really looking back 48 hours if we're talking about contact tracing and then notifying those who came in close contact for a prolonged period of time. Close contact is more than is six feet or less. Prolonged period of time is 15 minutes or greater. Um, some folks are using shorter windows. Some people are looking at more than a couple days. But um, I, th I think this could be a, a good time, Matt, to talk about, you know, testing in general and, and what an employer's rights are on testing, right? Yeah, I mean, so the EEOC came out with guidance several months ago uh, specifically talking about uh, testing because ordinarily uh, requiring uh, employees to undergo a medical test would be a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. But with the pandemic, uh, what the EEOC has said in its guidance is employers can mandate uh, testing uh, so long as the tests are uh, safe and reliable. And so as that has now evolved, they've now come out with further guidance that says it's still okay to test uh, and mandate testing of employees for the COVID-19 uh, active uh, virus, but you can't uh, force folks to get the antibody test because the antibody test is now uh, has been no longer to be uh, reliable. Um, so if you wanted to take uh, that stance, you really could require everyone uh, to be tested. Uh, but as, as Dennis and, and Trisha have in, indicated, sort of in your lines of business, we're not seeing mandatory uh, testing across the board as a, as a common uh, you know, practice uh, for office workers. And I think on that point, Matt, one of the things that also came out recently is that in the event that you did require mandatory um, the insurer doesn't need to cover it if it's a mandatory requirement by the employer, but rather it's on the that the employer could be held responsible for that cost. And those costs can be, they vary greatly. 
Um, we have seen the cost of some of these tests not only in the hundreds, but frankly thousands uh, of dollars per patient, you know, per individual. So, um, you know, th those are some uh, things to just be aware of uh, in advance. But just to wrap up there on that one more, I wanted to mention, what do you really need to do? In the event you have a positive employee and they were in the office when they were symptomatic um, or even a couple of days prior to them becoming symptomatic, you need to notify your other employee. That you certainly need to do. Now, you may land with a situation where you land with multiple individuals at the same time of exposure. You need to also evaluate, is anybody actually in close contact with that person, as I mentioned from contact tracing perspective? In the event you I do that, you, what you want to be doing is interviewing the person who tested positive, find out where they were, who they come in contact with, you know, and who did they think they were, you know, less than six feet for greater than 15 minutes. Those individuals you would want to talk to directly, you know, and let them know that you want them or send, send them a notice that you may want them to also self-quarantine. That is best practices for those individuals. What we've really seen is when we look at it and you do that back, you know, and do the contact tracing and do the evaluations, the number of people that actually need to be, you know, self-quarantined is small because for the reasons that Patricia said, people are not jumping into people's offices anymore. They're not going to lunches necessarily. They really are maintaining it in the office setting. And even if they're going into a conference room, they're sitting far apart and maybe they're wearing a facial covering while they're in there. Uh, that's another factor that even if you go through the six feet, 15 minutes, you know, close contact for a long period of time, the other piece is if people wearing facial coverings during that time period, that is a mitigating factor. And you just as a business, you know, need to determine, do you really think that, you know, does that mean that person that was there, were they both wearing them? So maybe there isn't a need then to, you know, have that person self-quarantined. You may still want to notify them that somebody in the office or they came in contact with, you know, tested positive in the office, but may not require them to be self-quarantined. So it is this kind of gamut of situations. The other thing I just want to mention is some counties in the last month have gone forward with, if you have multiples, so let's say you do have two, pay, two employees that test positive, even in a small office, those county departments of health have asked to be notified. And, you know, so just be aware of that in the event that, you know, you do have that situation. And that's why, you know, this is, as much as we're talking about OSHA, CDC, and, you know, federal guidance, it is also very local on what you specifically may be required to do. One other thing, just to jump in there, because I, I saw one of the questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, as you're going through this contact tracing that, that Dennis and Patricia and I talked about, you know, it's very important that you do not identify that employee by name, right? Like you would say, hey, someone on the seventh floor has tested positive uh, for COVID. We want to, you know, find out whether you were at this XYZ, you know, place in time. Uh, because if you do uh, mention that person by name, you could potentially be violating HIPAA and the ADA. Thank you, Matt. Patricia, I'm interested to know if you've had this experience, how receptive are people to participating in this contract tracing exercise? Are you met or have any of your clients been met with resistance from their employees? Um, really, no one, no one has. For those clients that are doing it, um, I have not heard any feedback about employees being um, resistant to that. Um, the one thing that I was going to add to the to the prior chain of conversation was I, I recommend, and we've talked to some of our client organizations about crafting in advance the communication that you're going to provide to employees should mm -hmm. contact positive. It's almost inevitable. Um, so sort of a generic, you know, you know, it might be a couple different versions that you'd want to have handy. But having that handy so that you can put that out there as quickly as possible, I think is a good strategy. Thanks, Patricia. And that segues well to the next topic, which I'll ask Matt to comment on initially. Um, there's a lot to convey to employees with all that we're dealing with and putting in place in our offices and then in turn in contact tracing uh, issues and the like. Matt, are there legal requirements or best practices around communication and training? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, some uh, state and local guidance actually specifically says that you must provide training. So Connecticut, for example, when it came out with its reopening guidelines says you must provide training. Doesn't necessarily define what the training is, but sort of taking a step back before training, I think all of the panelists here would agree that best practices to, is to develop and roll out 
uh, updated uh, policies to your employees for return to work. And whether that is going to be the social distancing policies, the staggered shifts, the you know, requirements to wear face coverings and the like, um, you know, whether you're gonna require uh, an attestation uh, that you don't have symptoms, et cetera. All of those, all of those uh, protocols should, should be rolled out and, and put in place uh, before you're opening. Or if you're now opening, you, know, you should quickly uh, get those in place and, and pass them out just like you would any uh, updates to your employee handbook or your sexual harassment policy or the like. And then uh, you could then provide training. And the training may be, I mean, Dennis and I have done webinars specifically for particular clients that were opening and wanted to get that requirement done. So we were on the phone with their employees kind of ticking through uh, their new protocols. So that's one way to do it. I think the HR department could do it. Uh, you also could possibly, you know, send this out to everyone and say, hey, you know, if you have any questions before you come back to work, please contact HR. I think all of those could potentially um, work as, as, you know, fulfilling that uh, training requirement. But I, and I think that, uh, you know, the more communication, uh, the better. Uh, you know, for example, you know, our firm as, as, uh, things progress, uh, and as Patricia has, has mentioned for for her offices and other clients, you know, depending on where uh, you have an office and where that state is, and their sort of phase uh, reopenings, different um, companies may have different uh, issues and protocols for different offices. And so we've had communications firm wide since March, but now there's uh, actual communications office by office too, as to whether you can come in or not. Thank you, Max. Yeah. Patricia, we're already in a very highly regulated industry and our employees are used to following the rules. We're now introducing a new set of rules for employees to follow. So what are your suggestions for ensuring that they do, in fact, follow the rules? Um, and what if they don't or if they're resistant to the rules as they've been designed? Well, I think um, a couple of general things to keep in mind. Again, communication is the key. Um, if, if the rules are different, if they're new, um, telling employees what those rules are is really important. Um, and once might not be enough. Um, it takes a while for people to change behavior. So understand that going in as well. Um, you know, habits are hard to change. So, um, keeping that in mind, continuing that communication. Um, and then I think if there are people who aren't following the rules, what I've found is that there are other employees who might police their colleagues. And um, so, and that can be a tricky area too. Um, so you may want to consider encouraging employees to come to a supervisor or to human resources if they identify someone that they don't believe is following those new rules and policies um, rather than addressing it head on. Again, it depends on the relationship. It depends on the office culture. It depends on a, a host of things. But those are some things I think to think about in advance is how you would address someone who isn't following the rules, who is resistant for whatever reason. And then again, I recommend dealing with those individuals in those individual situations one-to-one -one. and having you know HR or the supervisor having an individual conversation with that employee who might not be following the rules and and dealing with it that way. Thank you so I think one of the challenges as you're speaking that I'm thinking about in my own mind is we're speaking as if people are returning to the office in the very near term um, and we don't know if that's the case so Patricia, I'll, I'll ask you this question and perhaps the others have a comment. Um, we know currently people's circumstances vary quite widely. There are people at home with children. Um, there's uncertainty about the school year starting and what that will mean for people. Um, how do you make arrangements fair for everyone? We talk about flexibility. Yeah, what does that look like and for how long does it last? I, again, flexibility is the key. I think um, employers are allowing flexibility now for all employees and employers need to evaluate 
there are any pressing reasons why they can't continue to allow flexibility going forward. Um, because if not, you're absolutely right. There will be some employees who will say, I don't have small children at home. So, you know, why is Mora allowed to stay home, you know, with her kids and I have to come into the office. So again, thinking in advance about what kind of flexibility is going to be allowed, addressing situations on a case by case basis, but ensuring that you're being as fair and even handed as possible. Um, and, and just trying to continue with that flexibility. I was thinking that um, prior to everything shutting down in early March, um, we had some client organizations that were completely resistant to remote work and telework. Mm -hmm. Required employees to be in the office Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day, unless they were on vacation or out sick. Um, so all of a sudden we're thrust into this environment where there is no further choice in the matter. Um, and I think what most employers have seen, if not all employers have seen, have, employees have risen to the challenge and have been quite productive and in many cases, even more productive working remotely, even those who have personal challenges at home, small children, elderly parents to deal mm -hmm. with. Um, and then flexibility also means, um, and we've seen this over the last few months, allowing employees to work perhaps different hours. We have employees that work very early in the morning and then they might not be online for two or three hours and then they're online again in the late afternoon, early evening. And if that's working, there's no reason to not continue to allow it for, for all employees if that's effective for both employer and employee. Absolutely. And where flexibility is a bit different than, say, accommodations, I expect that as we, as employers start to return to their offices, the employer should anticipate accommodation requests from employees. And we can talk about fear versus medical need versus personal circumstances. Um, Matt, how should we handle accommodation requests? And how should, sorry, just no. an, another element to that. Should employers be concerned about uh, potential discrimination issues? vis-a-vis accommodations. Sure, so, so I agree with um, everything that Patricia just said um, in terms of flexibility. Let's now just talk real quickly about sort of the legal issues. So if, if you're in a business where you, know, you want to require folks to come back, even though maybe productivity is great working at home, but you've got business reasons, collaboration, client pressure, whatever it is, that you, you know, want people to come back to the office. The, the general premise is general fear and anxiety of getting COVID or, you know, not wanting to come back because you've been productive at home is not a legally protected uh, category. So what is legally protected? If you have some medical uh, disability, uh, that is potentially uh, protected or if you are uh, in uh, a high risk category that the CDC has identified, some type of medical condition where if you contract COVID, you're more likely to have complications, which uh, include, but are not limited to those uh, age 65 or higher, those that are immunocompromised, those with diabetes, those with a, you know, a, a BMI of over 40, uh, those, those types of things, then what the employer has an obligation to do is to engage in the interactive process and to see whether uh, there is some type of accommodation. And the EEOC has specifically said that the accommodation does not have to be to continue to allow them to work from home. It actually specifically mentions potential uh, increased PPE, staggered shifts, uh, you know, uh, moving someone, maybe a, a secretary that's in a cube uh, now is put into their own office because they have a medical condition. So those are all the types of accommodations uh, that you may be uh, able to, uh, you know, discuss. The flip side of it, and this question was just actually asked uh, by uh, one of the attendees, is the EOC in those same uh, guideline says that you cannot preclude folks that are in those high risk categories from coming 
back to work. So you could not have a blanket rule that says anyone 65 years or older is prohibited from coming back to work. If they want to come back to work, they can come back to work. You can have, you can have uh, a dialogue with them about whether there's any accommodations that they might need, but you can't have a blanket rule that they can't come back to work. And then I think one of the biggest questions that keeps coming up from clients is, okay, so what about folks that may not have a medical condition, but what if they have personal circumstances? What are they supposed to do? And so a lot of our clients are putting in their policies, you know, if you have a personal circumstance, please contact HR and we can discuss it. So that doesn't mean you're guaranteeing an accommodation, but for example, if someone has a personal circumstance, meaning that their spouse is, you know, a nurse in the IC unit, ICU unit, you know, um, treating COVID patients, that employer may say, you know what, it's probably best if you don't come back to work right now, just as an example. The, the broader question, which Patricia raised, and I know that there's been some questions here as well, you know, can we just make a blanket rule that anyone that has kids uh, that aren't going to be going back to school, uh, you know, they have to continue to work online, can we just tell those parents they don't have to come in? And, and the problem with a blanket rule like that is you're setting yourself up potentially for an age discrimination claim or a familial uh, status discrimination claim. I will, I will say that there's one caveat, however, because San Francisco just came out with its a new ordinance. It's only going to last for about 60 days, but it actually talks about to the extent operationally feasible, we should try to accommodate those folks with family circumstance issues to see whether they can continue to work from home. So that is, that is just a unique rule within San Francisco. But I would say in general, you should not be treating folks uh, with kids differently than your general population. Thank you, Matt. So I think, um... As you've described it, it sounds pretty straightforward, but the reality is it'll be complicated for many of us as we experience or respond to requests. So more to come, I'm sure. Dennis, what about handling business or even personal travel with staff? At what point is it reasonable and what uh, parameters can an employer place on business or personal travel? Sure. Um, one, some employers, you know, I, this one's evolved and even in this month alone. so. Um, frankly, you know, if you'd asked us a month ago, it would have been, you know, folks from Florida could travel anywhere and folks from New York could not, um, or New Jersey. But now it's frankly a, a bit of a reversal here. So I think, you know, the fact is that um, some states such as New York, Connecticut, New Jersey have put out actual tribal advisories for, I mean, it's upwards now of, uh, what, 14, 13, 14 states currently as we stand here today. But it, it frankly, it, it's not based on the state. It's not, it's actually based on the number of positive uh, individuals per 100,000 residents. So, for example, New York is 10, um, as is Connecticut and New Jersey, um, but in the state of, you know, Illinois or, or city of Chicago, I believe it's 15. So, there are some variations, and what they're saying there and what that has to mean is, if you're coming from one of those states and you're going into one of the states that has a travel restriction, um, you need to be checking that before you go in. You need to be checking if your state is one that has any travel restriction uh, on folks coming or on you going somewhere as a result um, because of the current incidences. Um, why that could be an issue is both on a personal as well as on a business travel side, um, the requirements there are that you, you know, quarantine for 14 days. And if you're going for business reasons, um, particularly I would say, and you're going from somewhere that maybe is a higher incidence, some, you know, and you're going into a state that has a travel restriction, this could be a real challenge for you, you know, not just by the Department of Health or somebody else wanting to track down, which they do have the ability to do, uh, and some of them are doing it based on you taking a flight and the like uh, and asking you those questions. But frankly, when you're going to a customer, a potential customer or, you know, uh, you know, current clients, for, you know, and they understand that you've been there, they're maybe we're all pretty aware of where what this guidance has been and what's come out. So you want to make sure you're watching that because somebody's going to ask you and that could be a, just a, you know, a challenge from a business perspective, not, you know, that someone else, something else might happen necessarily, but you definitely want to be checking those. 
Um, so some states have also really said to continue to limit, you know, anything that's not an essential business travel or an essential travel. Um, we've seen a, a lightening of that um, for a lot of the professional services that, you know, would be applicable to many on this call today. And the, I think the reason being is, you know, the shutdown lasted a long time and businesses were impacted significantly. And so people need to evaluate their situations, feel, see how they might be able to travel in the best means possible and also easy way to also limit their potential exposures. But at the same point, you know, being aware of the state that they're coming from, the states that they're going to, and then as well as if they're going back to a state, but they were recently in one, what are their current obligations and, you know, complying with that. Um, it is a um, ever moving target. Um, I think that there will be other states that will come out with similar um, standards um, to New York and Illinois and Connecticut, for example, and New Jersey. But, you know, we, we keep seeing it evolve every, every other day, frankly. And it will continue to most definitely, as you mentioned. I'm, I'm gonna jump to another topic just be, to give it some time. And I know we won't cover it in full, Patricia, but with all that's occurring, we know that employees' mental health is important. And there certainly has been a lot of stress stemming from the pandemic, social unrest, the pain that's layered onto these uh, situations. How are you guiding employers to deal with potential employee mental health issues and the like? Um, many of our client organizations, and Markham as well, um, has uh, a, a, an EAP, EAP standing for Employee Assistance Program. And it is typically, it's an underutilized benefit that most employers offer. Um, some employers we find don't even realize they have it because it, it comes sort of an add-on to like a, a long-term disability or a life insurance plan. Um, and it allows employees at no cost to the employer or the employee to access a host of resources, both online and live. So many EAP programs will allow an employee, say up to three or six uh, in-person visits with a therapist or a counselor per year and might also include family members. So we've been encouraging our client organizations to promote the EAP um, and around specific topics too, not just saying, you know, as a reminder, we have an employee assistance program, but we might have a topic. And the EAP programs themselves will reach out to the HR staff and say, here's the topic of the month, here's something you might wanna share with your employees. So that's definitely a resource that um, we've encouraged our client organizations to promote. I would also um, suggest that we have, and we've had uh, employers review their medical benefits so that they understand what the mental health component that's covered under the medical benefits might be. So if an employee comes to human resources or to a supervisor um, and has questions regarding access to mental health, those questions can be answered. And then another suggestion um, that uh, we have made is to, in some instances, to allow employees to just take a day off, just knock off early. If it's clear that someone is feeling overstressed, they're, you know, short, uh, out of sorts, um, and allowing managers and supervisors permission to let that employee sort of knock off a little early, take a day off, what have you. Um, and then finally, another thing that I saw, and you're right, we can't possibly <laughs> cover all this to, to cover on this topic. Um, I've seen recently, and I wish I could remember where I saw it, but a couple of different places have good common sense advice for how to talk to someone that you might identify as, as having some stress-related issues, potentially mental health issues beyond saying, how are you doing? Are you okay? I've noticed, but it was a series of conversation starters that might allow someone to, to open up and say, yes, I'm really struggling. And then perhaps pointing them towards some of the resources that I mentioned. That's definitely helpful. Earlier in the conversation, someone mentioned, I think it was Dennis Public Transportation. And I'm just curious to know, for many of the panelists, um, it's such a challenging topic and it's something that for my firm at least, um, we're fortunate not to, to have this challenge. What are the good suggestions or any new suggestions you may have heard of late that employers can consider? 
I mean, I'll jump in there and then maybe turn it to Matt um, or and Patricia. Um, for, for but one thing I just wanted to mention is what we're really seeing is for those that have already restarted. So if your businesses are, you're thinking of doing it now this month on public transportation, the, the rails and the subways, they're in fact fairly empty. Um, and so people have really been able to social distance on them so far. Um, same as the buses, um, you know, it really hasn't been that issue. Uh, and people on those, you know, are really wearing face masks. They're required to wear face masks in most situations on public transportation, and people are complying um, and really keeping their distances from others. Um, and really cognizant is, you know, somebody isn't it, you know, people, you know, uh, are taking it extremely seriously. So we're actually seeing that, you know, those who are and are in the situation they currently need to or they're, you know, you've made decisions to go back, then in utilizing public transportation, it's actually working out okay, and we have not seen an uptick um, in terms of, you um, cases as a result of it at this point. Uh, I think it's be more something towards the, you know, the fall as many other businesses start to go back um, more fulsome um, and schools maybe and others um, that that may be changed. But right now it, it has not been as significant an issue for those needing to utilize it. Um, but Matt, Patricia. I mean, I agree. I agree with uh, Dennis's perspective. I also think that uh, it's sort of, a, it might be a chicken and egg kind of situation because uh, a lot of businesses haven't really fully opened uh, in the summer. And so, it, you know, you do see pictures of the New York subway or you do see pictures of the DC, you know, metro and they seem pretty empty and people are able to effectively social distance. But as Dennis and Patricia, you know, I'm sure will agree, if, if there's this big surge and everyone's coming back after Labor Day, it's not going to you know, it's not going to be that easy, and so the reason I say it's a chicken or an egg, I think some uh, companies are are thinking about that and saying, well, I don't know how we can bring back all of our folks. If you know, uh, I I just look at at even in my office in D.C. Right, like the majority of folks that have parking spots right now are are lawyers. And then the majority of folks that are taking public transportation are non-lawyers, but they make up many more of the, you know, employee population. And, you know, we won't have the, if everyone wanted to drive, there wouldn't be spots in the garage. And so I think that these are issues that, that every employer is going to continue to face. Absolutely. And one additional issue, and we may call this you know, more administrative in nature, is the return to the office as it relates to um, office equipment, perhaps, that employees took home when they were told to work from home um, and now in time will be asked to return. So, Patricia, how are your clients thinking about the office chair that left within an employee or the monitors? Are those things that um, are expected to return or are we setting up uh, kind of a in another setup in, in office as well for each person. Again, it, this is something that we encourage our client organizations to think about. And it, again, everything happened so fast. It was you know one of a list, long list of things that employers had to think about before shutting down. Um, but many of our client organizations were asking us about that. You know, employees don't have the proper equipment to work from home. What should we offer? So the kinds of guidance that we were offering was, you know, whatever you can financial, what's financially feasible for you to offer, um, you know, allow the employee to purchase it, but then under, you know, describe up front who, who that equipment belongs to, whether it reverts to the employer, um, when things, you know, employees come back to the office, whether the employee can keep it. Um, and then there were some employers that we worked with that had things like, um, uh, they have like a, um, a, a buying like a discount, like a volume discount with with Dell or something like that, where they were able to direct employees to purchase certain equipment from their own suppliers and get appropriate discounts, or even purchase and and go on the uh, the employer's bill. Um, but in terms of returning the equipment, the conversations that we had a few months back was try to decide upfront so you don't have to have those conversations when people are coming back and. An employee might think that, well, I can keep this new laptop that you gave me uh, when it wasn't addressed up front. So there might be some trickier conversations down the road, but we encourage that to be addressed early on. Makes sense. Thank you. So we're five minutes about to the hour. I want to take a
quick minute just to thank you, Patricia, Dennis, and Matt. On behalf of the IAA and the participants who joined us today, thank you for your insight, your guidance, advice, and best practices are always helpful to consider as we tackle the challenges the pandemic has forced us to address and will um, and new challenges that will likely come about. For the participants, please contact the IAA if there are topics you would like to see covered in future webinars or events. There are a few questions in the chat box here that we're not going to be able to get to today, but topics that I anticipate could be addressed in a future event. Um, we'll do our best and I'll, the IAA will um, offer us follow up here to get to those open questions to make sure that they're addressed accordingly. I appreciate your time today and thank you for participating in the webinar.